Hi everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. It's my pleasure to welcome you all the panelists and the participants. We are all passing through a difficult time. We are in a process of reshaping our daily lives as social beings. We are now having a webinar in place of a seminar. Having a webinar has made it possible for many of us from different parts of the country to join in free of any cost. It's a digital privilege of which a large section of people are deprived. But we will try to use it for a good cause, to deal with the social crisis arising out of the pandemic. Gatekeepers of the mainstream culture have systematically created a false sense of pride in our society. There are two distinct and contending trends within what is called the mass culture in our country. One trend which is patronized by the elites and the other expressing the popular sentiments of the ordinary people. Intellectually and intellectual and moral leadership of our mainstream culture is clearly with the upper caste, upper class patriarchal forces. We have to strive to change this situation. Social media is being flooded with frivolous celebrity messages, music videos, TikToks, Mahabharat, Ramayan, so on and so forth, so called expressions of the popular culture. In the background of the COVID situation, we can clearly see that institutions which govern our social relationships like state, media, judiciary, etc. are acting in a way that results in reducing our sphere of uh, social communication. An artist, activist or any ordinary citizen, we cannot win this war against COVID individually. We, uh, a social crisis needs a social response. Uh, we must act to ward off the specter of gloom, despair and uncertainty. We must define our purpose as producers of people's true culture. As innovators, idea generators and creative people, and we must explore how, why, and what next. The production of cultural goods like TV shows, cinemas, plays, music shows, art objects, all has come to a halt. Artistic response to the COVID situation is yet to find significant expression in the public domain. Creative workers in the art, world are facing uh, unemployment and hunger. Hospital beds are full. People are dying of disease. What, ripple, uh, what real effect can we have as, an art, as artists on this world? This concern brought us from non-Nirman Sanskritic Manch and intercultural resources together to organize this webinar face to face with pandemic, cultural reflections and expressions. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me this webinar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start. <laughs> Every evening she runs to terrace and I follow her little steps. Actually she goes to see the world on the roof and introduce me the moon, the birds, the leaves and the squirrels who runs on the branches of banyan tree in the back of our home. Because we did not go out from last four months, but we are having great time at home. And managing my studio practice with Sia, she is only two years now. <clears throat> because of pandemic, we are staying for a long time period at home. And during my stay, I look back to my work and rethinking of it. I realized that what is a home quarantine or isolation in terms of women who live her whole life or half of her life only at home. Mm. 
me what happens to her and dealing with domestic work being a woman here i would like to show you one of my work which is a discussion between mother and daughter the work is called his home is world his world is home please show the picture <clears throat> this is a object we call it chukla to make chapatis collected from my mom's kitchen here i am sharing a discussion between me and my mother where she speaks me home is world and i'm telling her world is home and it's become a question for me on social economical and political condition of women in society where she spends her most of time in kitchen and that is why that is always unacknowledged and that's why i named this work is home is world is world is home Fortunately this work is collected by a French collector in Paris and I made this work for my solo show in 2016 During this moment of quarantine the whole world is going through a mental distress and health crisis On the other side in India I'm looking at the work daily wage laborers and migrant workers who are suffering with hunger and lee and have to walk long distance to go back their villages and home here i would like to show the work called beast of burden i express this concern through a knife animal donkey for me a donkey is a symbol of beauty and power the donkey is always associated with working class people and like them the donkey is hard working knife and belongs to the margin it is an animal relegated to the sideline just like the labor class people who are the one built the city and that is always unseen but the donkey is also a novel beast the image of donkey has an important role in trade history it has been transporting material from one country to another country through the centuries for me the image of donkey has a large dimension in religions too it is the lowly donkey that carries mary to the birth of jesus christ it is said that donkey stands for women and durga in her avatar of kalaratri uses the donkey as her mount in this sense this is also a self portray with inspiration there is another work i would like to i, I would like to share you and it's an installation called unseen city when i was in delhi and i was studying in shivnadari university i have seen there were lots of construction and building of city processes were happening at the same time i noticed a very symbolic object from the worker site the object is called vinda and vinda they use for carry heavy weights and this particular object i have chosen to express my interpretation to the situation of unacknowledged workers and laborers and their contribution to the building the city i started collecting old items binda like the cloth and sacks from the laborers in exchange for a new item and the presented them and presented them as an installation imagining a city i collected item from the workers for last for four straight months and during this process i had lot lots of conversation with them and got to know most of them belongs to bihar uttar pradesh and bengal then i realized that these states 
has a rich history but in current scenario facing poverty and that is one reason why people are moving elsewhere in search of work and better lives. I grew up in Patna and did my bachelor degree from Patna School of Art and Craft which is nearby Patna Museum where I could see lots of old sculptures and paintings of Patna Kala. I am inspired by the idea of painting of common people lifestyle in Patna Kalam and so always investigate in my work common areas. After completing my bachelor's degree in Patna, I moved to Delhi for Masters of Fine Arts. During this period, I got a junior fellowship ministry from Ministry of Culture and Government of India for two years in 2012 to 2014. And then I joined Shiv Nadar University for my master's degree research program in 2014 to 16. And at the same year, I come to Mumbai for my solo show at Clark House Initiative Mumbai. From last two years, I am staying in Patna with my parents and during this stay, my work departure to the domestic work and untold story of beauty and power. Thank you so much. Cultural theorist living in Bombay. Nancy, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me, Vandana? Yes, clearly. Yeah. So thank you, Vandana. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you, George. And thank you, Ranjita, for your beautiful presentation. And I will take your question, is home world or is world home? And let, let yeah. that segue into my presentation for the day. Oh, wow. My presentation is called Ambedkar's Violin, A Parable for Our Times. I have lived for a long time with an endearing and instructive story of how Baba Sahib Ambedkar learned to play the violin. Wow. Imagine Ambedkar scratching away with his bow like Sherlock Holmes when he could not find a solution to a tricky political problem. Or imagine him playing soulfully for a few moments before the chaos of public life burst in on him. In the early 50s, which turned out to be the final decade of his life, Ambedkar asked the Sathe brothers, who were known to be experts in the field, to tutor him. At first, they were understandably nervous, intimidated by the aura of the great leader. However, they were relieved to find that he also had a great sense of humor. When the Sathe brothers, at his instigation, imitated animal sounds on the violin, Ambedkar would burst into laughter. At the same time, he was rigorous and systematic in his learning. He asked the Sathes for a book that summarized the latest knowledge in the field. Bal Sathe gave him the book, Violin, How to Master It. The next time they met, he told them that he had read the book from cover to cover, but had realized from the colophon that it wasn't the latest edition. He might he might have asked in his inimitable manner, was it up to date? From this story of Ambedkar's violin, I would draw three lessons. The first one being that when we think of Ambedkar, we think of his epic political project of dismantling a millennia old system of sanctified oppression. We tend not to think of him as a cultural thinker or person engaged with the arts. As a writer, Ambedkar was a literary artist. He engaged with complex questions in a memorable and lapidary style, distinguished for his clarity and robustness. As a publisher and editor, he paid close attention to the masthead, design, and typography of the five newspapers that he published. Some of the famous ones being Mukhanayak, Leader of the Silent, published in 1920, Bahishkrut Bharat, India ostracized 1927, and Prabuddha Bharat 1956. There was also Samta and Janta. 
It is intriguing that he learned the violin uh, from 1951 to 53, which was a few years before he converted to Buddhism. He gave careful thought to the image of the Buddha, the choice of symbolism for the resurgent Buddhism, and took pride in the cultural history of Buddhism and its artistic heritage. This is my first takeaway from the story of Ambedkar's violin. It strengthens us in our understanding that political action and cultural refinement go hand in hand. They are not opposites or alternatives. They proceed simultaneously. They both contribute to the same goal, the assertion of a self that is confident, creative, and can reclaim its agency in the world. The classical leftist understanding was that one must first address the problems of the base, that is economics and politics, and only then move on to the questions of the superstructure, society and culture. The reality is that base and superstructure are closely interrelated, and we must focus on both equally. Cultural rights are not optional extras to be worried about after political rights have been achieved. The right to articulate one's thought, to organize forms of artistic activity, to have access to education, museums, galleries, concert halls, performance platforms, these are political rights as much as they are cultural rights. My second takeaway from the story of Ambedkar's violin is this. To be radical does not mean to throw away classical forms of discipline and training, whether in the arts or the humanities. Ambedkar repeatedly emphasized the importance of a critical sensibility and constant dialogue with the inherited archive of any discipline, whether it be history, sociology, or law. Therefore, it is vital that there should be universal access to such a pedagogy for all those who seek it, irrespective of their social and cultural capital. Pedagogy also offers us an entry point to an intellectual context and a com community of practice. The pandemic has made intensely visible questions that should exercise us at all times, questions of equity, food distribution, housing for migrant workers, right to education, and cultural rights. Let me focus on education, which is now inevitably online. This has brought into focus a digital divide that will undoubtedly accentuate and worsen existing socioeconomic inequalities. When can you, when can you have effective online education? When you have uh, electricity supply, which is uh, electricity, electricity supply, which is uninterrupted, when you have access to net connectivity, when you have the various devices that are necessary for uh, net communication, those who enjoy such access are privileged. Those who do not will be further excluded from education, not to mention the corollary that there is also a language divide. The privileged tend to be Anglophone, the excluded tend to be Bhasha speakers. There is also a gender divide, as we know that even before the pandemic, unemployment figures were rising. During the pandemic, joblessness has been rife, and many NGO activists have warned us that uh, that uh, post-pandemic, the first thing that will go overboard is girls' education. If we look at the online cartography of net presence, we will find that most of the cultural platforms conduct their sessions in English, whether they be museums, festivals, or galleries. This means that they exclude a majority of Indians. Under these circumstances, how do we secure the cultural rights of those deprived on linguistic grounds? My third takeaway has to do with the exercise of choice, which is integral to cultural rights. Baba Saheb chose to study the violin. A nativist might well ask why he did not choose to study the sitar. Cultural rights are of two kinds. First, rights that guarantee access to cultural entitlements. These must be legally enacted. Second, are rights that guarantee opportunity for cultural choices. These must be socially promoted. In a caste society, this involves a major psychological paradigm shift away from the crude determinism that decides what is proper to someone based on that person's birth. Sometimes you'll find that even liberal intellectuals and well-meaning reformers fall into the trap of determinism in the inclusions and exclusions they dictate to others. 
Some of them believe that the crafts will collapse if the son or daughter of an artisan does not practice the hereditary occupation, or that underprivileged chil children should study in their mother tongue even though no tertiary education is available in that language. And why should Brecht be progressive while Beethoven is dismissed as bourgeois? Why should jazz, an originally subaltern art, be alien while Hindustani music, originally an elite art, be local? This kind of determinism always misses out on the various hybrid convergences that have shaped every cultural form. No cultural form is born pure, nor is it necessarily and immutably linked to a particular class. Opera, today regarded as high culture, began in low culture. The folk melodies of migrant or nomadic ethnic groups are now enshrined in our Hindustani ragas. This aspect of cultural choice is integral to an individual's freedom to find purpose and direction in life. This freedom cannot be subject to a determinism based on birth, ethos, local, and so forth. It must express the individual's desires and affinities, the solidarities that she or he forms across and sometimes against prevailing factors. Thus, the violin is part of a common human heritage and not just the privilege of a particular class and not simply to be construed in class terms, which has been the unhappy limitation, limitation too often of a notion of progressive culture. A properly progressive culture is not a table of contents divided between acceptable and unacceptable. It is a culture animated by a progressive attitude whose defining features are a democratization of access to culture, an inclusive pedagogy, and an emphasis of cultural choice as the essential step towards self-fashioning and thus true freedom. Thank you. So then I would uh, invite uh... Sudhakar, Sudharak Olve, the documentary photographer, to make his presentation, please. Again, uh, Sudharak Olve will be sharing some visuals with us, as well as his uh, spoken presentation. Okay, so um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And um, uh, so I'll share, uh, you know, what... Um, Ranjita and uh, Nancy had kind of linked, and it for for me it's uh, a, a very different uh, uh, way to uh, take it uh, forward. So I'll share some images of uh, my work uh, 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 on uh, Dalits in India and how the pandemics has you know uh, kind of uh, uh, come together uh, with so. So Dalit in India were historically treated as untouchables, outcast and later socially depressed communities. However, Dalit is not a homogeneous category and they are just as divided from each other along caste, regional, linguistic and general cultural lines as they are from the rest of the society. Dalits were engaged in politing occupation and their status arose from the kind of occupation they perform. They invariably performed the polluting occupations in the village economy, which was also the social obligation. Removing dead animals, skinning animal carcasses, uh, tanning leather and making shoes, cleaning um, human waste, handling crosses, handling crosses at crematorium, burying grounds in the village economy. In the village, in this village economic and social structures. The lit were subjected to caste bondage and direct caste subordination and exploitation. However, from the late 19th century, the Lits from the rural area had begun to migrate to the cities. Caste Hindus were usually non inclined to perform menial job because of a strong notion of ritual purity and pollution and degrading and stigmatizing status associated with the such cleansing and menial jobs. The Lits are already segregated on caste lines in Indian villages. Dalit houses and villages are either on outskirts or, or are physically separated from main village. Even in cities and most of the urban areas, Dalit largely lives in a slum settlements. These settlements are overcrowded crowded and people live in an extremely poor living condition. People are literally cramped into very small living spaces and have no options but to live in these conditions. These areas are characterized by poor structural quality of housing, in inadequate access to safe water 
and poor sanitation and insecure residential status. Dalits are subject to all kinds of discrimination and inequalities by the so-called racially and economically superior caste groups. There are many parts of rural India where the most brutal to sublet forms of untouchability are still practiced against Dalits. They are socially discriminated against and economic, economically exploited. There are few images uh, are which are atrocity images from around the country. This is from the Gujarat. Uh, you know, you can't have Ambedkar and Buddha. Uh, you cannot uh, display them in front of your house. So, so you know, this, so when I went and photographed this woman, it was inside the house. Uh, or, or the Pradeep, uh, Pradeep's friends is with his horse. Pradeep was killed uh, by for riding the horse because the upper class darbar came and uh, asked the family not to ride the horse and 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 pradeep rode the horse and pradeep was killed next day for just riding the horse or mahesh from gujarat is from the valmiki community the only family who cleans the uh, gutter uh, garbage from the village uh, and he, he once one day he wore the new clothes and a chain so he was beaten so badly for just wearing new clothes uh, again from the upper class um, and this is um, uh, again a one picture of mother and father he, the, the son went to see a, a a garba and he was killed brutally by uh, by uh, young people from the village why he is looking at the garba or or from maharashtra nitin age was talking he was seen talking to a young uh, upper class girl for just talking to a young girl, he was killed virtually and hanged to the tree. Or, or, or Amrita from, from or Amrita from Telangana, for she just got married in Taka. And the father has given uh, hired the killer and killed her, her husband. So as far as the current unprecedented and uncertain times of COVID-19 are concerned, the condition of majority of Dalits in India is near vulnerable. The, they remain trapped in informal sectors without any social security and their inclusion of most of the job in urban areas can best be described as unfair inclusion. Dalits and migrants in India had nothing to do with coronavirus for the very fact that it entered India via passport and these marginalized were one who ended up paying a very heavy price. They have lost their jobs, employment and were left to themselves during the lockdown period. Pradeep and his horse. This was the boy Mahesh who was beaten up for his clothes. This is a boy killed uh, for just kind of went to see a garba dance. Aniti Nagi from Maharashtra, he was a young bright boy and went to uh, the school and you know one one day the, the the he was talking to a young upper class girl. And brother came and beat him in a school, beat him behind the school, and then they went and beating him and killed him. And then and finally he hanged, he was hanged to the tree. This is Amrita from uh, uh, Telangana. It is an intercaste marriage, and father only had given money to kill the, uh, the son in law, and he was killed in, in, in a broad daylight for. for uh, So he's talking about the migrants. So 
more than corona virus the virus of poverty adversely impacted the lives of dalits and other marginalists in india the social distancing advocated to prevent spread of coronavirus in context of covid-19 might turn against them because of their status as a low caste and dalits caste system in india plays a crucial role in defining social and economic relations society has a long history and has been meaning in the context of social relation caste system in india plays a crucial role in defining social and economic relationship social distancing as norm is already so deeply entered in our society that shapes everyday social interaction this may adversely affect the historically disadvantaged communities day to day life of different communities and villages in india is governed by these norms of social distancing that are in place historically in village society and also applies to urban areas of greater extent and concept and con- in con- context of covid-19 the concept of social distancing may assume a very little and crucial form of discrimination in rural india and reflect in a subtle forms in urban context as well social distancing in rural and some extent in urban areas can be observed through the physical segregation of the different communities the lower caste in many villages in india are still not allowed to use the common pro- uh, property resources they are often not allowed to bury their dead in common burying ground or use uncommon crematorium so when we were kind of uh, uh, trying to understand what was happening with mandip- pandemic and i saw many workers and i followed them and it was mostly the mostly the marginalized and dalits were walking on the street <coughs> as soon as they reached the villages their villages their homes were marked they were uh, made quarantine quarantine and and they were kind of debarred from uh, from the social uh, structure of the village and at the same time what i found about the cultural practices uh, um, uh, that you know not many of artists have responded to, in a way uh, only i i could see that only few dalit artists have responded to the situation uh, and not uh, the whole whole art world as such or literary has has come out uh, you know because this uh, pandemics need empathy and togetherness unless and until that that uh, kindness is not there it is not going to to help uh, the marginalized people to 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 come back again in its in a cycle of uh, living or a better living so so the i think nancy has already discussed about the internet and education so most of this the workers uh, or the lead they have only salary of 7000 to 8000 rupees imagine to get those gadget or internet connection and and to make their children uh, uh, to study already there was so much uh, uh, hike in a fees that many uh, last couple of years many children have couldn't take go to a higher education either in europe or in india also so same thing will have will happen with the with the uh, uh, school uh, now for the education and about the art what i so i will just share a few last couple of images of two artists we are working together and making some uh, some uh, 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 collective together so this is uh, uh, professor sunil and uh, uh, vikram they both artists and poets and they'll share these works and i'll end my uh, uh, is stop
yeah, this is this was it. Right. Thank you so much. I hope it must have oh, been very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sudarak. Uh, that was uh, very interesting, uh, and your uh, photographs and also the sketches were uh, very interesting, uh, and your uh, photographs and also the sketches were uh, uh, added added to your presentation. Uh, I would now ask if is Naujot ready to to no. make a presentation. So this is Navjot's paper and she writes, in a time like this, which has disrupted lives of almost all human beings in the world, where millions have succumbed to death and many more are still at a high risk of this virus and are vulnerable while dealing with the adversity, uncertainties, anxious and stressful situations. The thought that what does it mean being face to face with pandemic I would say that when seen in different contexts, it varies depending upon the situations people are in, except the fact that anyone and everyone can be impacted by it, if not cautious in following the COVID rules. So I think some of these things are in point form. So I, I suppose Navjot would have elaborated on them, you know, when she would be speaking. But in my case, I just have to read it as it is. So sorry for the slight disjointed delivery. But what happens when people are suddenly thrown into circumstances totally out of their control? Then the meaning of being or remaining cautious gets subverted. So the experiences of those who have faced a disease from close proximity or have faced the tragedies of losing their closed ones, despite being in a position to avail the medical facilities, are different from those who've had to walk miles or travel in most severe, hostile and humiliating conditions including those who lost their lives on highways and railway, rail, railway lines due to the chaos caused by the sudden imposition of na nationwide lockdown by the central government with a generalized and a callous approach without proper logistics, sensitivity and concerns for a section of the population, which in reality constitutes the backbone of our urban economy and participates in building cities, in building the city's infrastructures. Migration is a livelihood option for millions of people. Navjot says, I've been in my, in my own environment in Bombay, and yet I constantly get a feeling that there exists more than one world. But by trying to stay grounded and understand the situation helps me cope with the uncertain and anxious times that the individuals and the world, in, that, that the individuals and the world is passing through. Its capacity to, to, uh, of, of, uh, of effect on us is tremendous and can be sensed even though not fully understood. Information and communication systems have a huge impact. My own immediate family is far away in a country badly affected and number of close relatives spread across the world. What was most shocking in India was the decision of suspending all forms of public transportation, economic activities, and various other possibilities for the people to understand the urgency of a move made by the center with no proper plans, preparations, and four, and four hours in hand for people to be psychologically ready and to be in a position to decide whether to stay <coughs> put or where they were or to leave for their native homes. As social and physical distancing was a new phenomenon at that moment, as well as the quarantine and public health care facilities offered were not clearly defined, which caused physical, mental and financial instability, as we can see even after three months, how it has brought turmoil to the lives of already destabilized millions for a long time to come, a time marked by hardship and unemployment. I do not want to generalize, but I'm not surprised by the way it happened because when it comes to the section of the population in any crisis, formulas adopted by the governments, regardless of who and which party is in power, is always the same. Their identities are vital in relation to voting politics. What is never thought and considered by those in power is the alienation effects on them and in case and, and in this case too, the alienation from the towns and cities these migrants worked in and earned their living the way they had to leave their villages, uh, uh, the, sorry, they had to leave um, 
sorry, the alienation effects on them, and in, the, and in this case too, alienation from the towns and cities these migrants worked in and earned, had to leave, and and their villages they had to, and the village and their villages they had to return to without any future. One cannot escape the impact of the constant circulation of images in the media. These kinds of elements in reality, uh, uh, these kinds of elements in reality, art has been revealing. As I said, that some of it has not been uh, written completely. It is in point form, so therefore it, it's a little disjointed. But if Navjot were giving her own presentation, then you know she would have added things to it. So uh, it's more sort of you know. So I feel bad that I'm sort of reading out her presentation without her actually being able to add, speak, speak and read her own paper. So. Um, However, alongside coping with this immediate uh, impact, the mind continues to think and imagine that a catastrophe of this scale at last will make the ruling governments world over, world over recognize and get to the root causes of this pandemic and acknowledge the urgency to work towards, as Noam Chomsky points out, and Navjot quotes, a new way of organizing society, one that conceives of a social and political order where profits are not about people, close quote. And in my words, so Navjot would say, not about people, not about any other living organisms on earth, as the earth itself makes demand on us to rethink of its species. I'm also reminded of Vandana Shiva speaking about why it is crucial we, provide, we protect the fragile web of life. We are part of, not as dominators, men over women, humans over nature, but as partners with every other life form on the planet. According to the scientists, what cannot be overlooked at and any longer is that the present crisis is not isolated from the causes of global warming manufactured by an extreme capitalist system we have ourselves we have allowed ourselves to live with which if we notice is not widely discussed in relation to such crises in the media for people to become more aware and to be able to apply critical or scientific thinking uh, and she Navjot then mentions the kerala model of dealing with covid which which she, she thinks is exceptional television is accessed by the maximum number of people even in the remote interiors in India, but most channels present a worldview interpreted in a particular manner that does not necessarily engage with the complexities of the reality, which demands multidimensional approach and the framing that takes place, which pose, poses questions regarding the effects of these frames on the public, because our consumption habits, including media, uh, from our value, including the media, form our values, our inclinations or tendencies in us. And there are layers and layers of belief that are tested in such critical times. Though independent news channels like NDTV regularly invites critical perspectives alongside some fact-checking websites or investigative outlets, including free press, journal, or scroll, but it is accessed by a small and a particular section of the society. My criticism of media or social media here is not to overlook how in the age of internet people are using phones to reach out. We have witnessed how forms of protest are explored and circulated by the students and other protesters from various cities during CA, NRP and NRC protests. By maintaining a social distance, one is participating in developing a culture of being responsible for oneself and for others to avoid transmission of the virus. But what obviously hits me most in the times of restrictions is my freedom to move around, to have face-to-face -face interaction by being amidst people, not necessarily uh, from my uh, not necessarily um, from my own field, but from different walks of life, which helps me to reflect not only on my own perceptions of situations, but diverse perspectives and interventions by the people. I like to engage with. <coughs> I like to engage with diverse perspectives and, and interventions made by people. I like it when art engages itself in the situations of the society and it can impart its liberating potential. I also believe that art and artistic inputs have already added to political struggles and we have seen it happening in the history of many nations in the world. As I have said before, I would like to end by saying that the privilege of being an artist is that one one can always move around freely in an imaginary and, and, and fictional world, which is never quarantined or restricted as in reality at this point of time. This is now Jodh's presentation. Thank you.
thank you Nancy and thank you Namjoon even though you were not able to join us so we missed out on that uh, but still uh, we did hear your reflections uh, I would now uh, request Vasanti Raman to read out uh, the text sent by the well-known filmmaker Kumar Shani which I think is a fitting end to this, uh, you know, the last presentation in this webinar because his contribution ranges over so many concerns, not just of the artist, uh, but also of people living through this pandemic. I am just going to read out what Kumar has sent to us. It begins as a letter because I had requested him to be part of this, uh, this panel discussion. But he chose to uh, write this and requested me to read it out. And I hope I can do justice to what he has written. I'm sure he would have done it much better. Dear Vasanti, our conversations over the phone were colored by the bizarre irony of speaking to each other through a medium which helps sustain contact where it has actually been lost. Nevertheless, it made me happy that you remembered me. This morning, Rimli sang to me a Tagore song based on the experience of the Fakirs who transfer their ecstasy into the dance of the mad and maddening wind and rain, their joy and sorrow into an impossibly simultaneous imminence where all falsehood retreats. I know that my heart beats to a virtual tune, that my words are but a reflection of the clash of one false consciousness against another that the sciences are locked in an extremely opaque course, that technologies are able to offer us the moon, uh, quite literally as property, thus voiding it of all other significance, voiding it of all poetry and the figures of imagination yielded by the cycles of nature, the overlaps of truth in the calendar singular events. We cannot afford to lose faith in ourselves just because the violent chemical and mechanical drugs and diseases are being replaced both in our body and the environment by electronic signals that deny the house sparrow the right to live, nor can we become slave, body shopped and mind shopped at Silicon Valleys around the world. The new religiosity of epithets transferred to quantity instead of the wind and the rain is perhaps the culmination of the battles between the Asura and the Devas to assert their hegemony over the world. From Bastar and from such other forests of yore, sensed in each and every breath of every person, the thought of divinity as consonance with the other, be it natural phenomena or one's beloved, free of any determinism that could govern the senses and or responses by our disciplines generated by the nervous system, we have created a universe that we could celebrate but are not able to navigate, bewildered as we are in our complicity with the system. The praxis of realizing the awesome, experiencing the adbhut in our daily living, in all action, everything that we do, have ever done or thought, every word that we have spoken, Every drop of mahua or sulfi that we have sipped makes us vulnerable to the bombs that are thrown 
by unmanned drones. No wonder the Vatavarana, we believe, is polluted. Our breath itself is the civilization of our discontent. Whereas the exchange of breath was the foundation of all performance, mental, physical, and spiritual. Virtual space needs no breath. Its simulation not only suffices, but also is made imperative like any other signal or virus. Moreover, it is both prefabricated and sanitized, safe. It proposes itself as safe for complex tasks, even as it simplifies the procedures, magnifies the achievements of our species into weightlessness, overcomes temporal limits. It offers to the pilot easy access to the skies and elegant touchdowns and to us the exclamation sakyat and thereby to the corporate state surveillance is offered 24 into 7. It is a world of many attractions in which we are constantly invited to participate at a price democratically turning us into voyeurs not only of discrete objects of desire, but of desire itself. Thus are created many deceptions, like the ones created by Duryodhana's architect Maya Danav in the Sabha Parva of the Mahabharat. The failure of the palace of Versailles to play the same historical role or to offer cakes to the tramps of Paris when they were starved of bread, heralded the promises held aloft by liberty. The beauty of color was unveiled from the east to the west, from the south to the north. The poor of Paris had been denied until the age of Delacroix the wondrous brilliance of the gorgeous East, while Venice passed on to the European elite in an intensity of varied saturation, the exploration of their innermost emotion within the parameters of a receding perspective, leading to the affirmation of an unmerciful, unmerciful God at the vanishing point. Horizons shifted. The bells started tolling from higher steeples. Our eyes, having gobbled up the energies of wind and water, women and men turned to the, to the skies once again. The laws of God became the laws of nature, verifiable more by number than name. But for most of us, who understand little or nothing of either name or number, even the residues thereof are being er erased. Our capacities to wish, to construct, to compose are being transferred to synthesizers. I do think that Rahmat Khan, the musician Fakir, embodied the wish of all those who fought for independence to free melody from incantation. I imagine that the fugue was released from its prescribed points of departure into spiraling intertwined waves of rapture by Bach and his contemporaries. When knowledge embeds itself in software, it begins to rule our lives so autonomously of ourselves that we consent to trade our freedom for the convenience offered in return. And those who own the software resort to the methods of primitive accumulation in spite of what one hears. 5% control, 95% of all resources. On that bed of weapons lies the celibate Bhishma, while all the flowers of every sp spring seem to be disappearing as soon as they appear, annihilated. 
some of you i know are those flowers resurrected by your own courage you have the perfume of your breath the music of your love play on play on for your being is the set of equilibria within the noisy turbulence of an imposed order terrorizing the significant into silence commanding through its signals a retreat from the fulfillment of evolution you will unravel the mysteries of the universe to itself as you have done all along kumar shah thank you thank you vasudhi that was uh, very beautiful uh we have come to the end of the presentations and i think uh, our presenters have given us a very wide range of things to think about i'll just say a few words before we open up the discussion some of the things that struck me while listening to these presentations and seeing the visual images as well um ranjita kumari started off with very brilliant uh, you know this idea of what the pandemic means to women suddenly it is not just women who are confined to the home but everybody and for the woman the home is the world but she is telling her mother that the world is is home and this is a, a message for all of us which we can think about in our own ways i also love the way that she has talked about this whole central problem of migration of laborers of the poor through the piles of their used clothing which she said she took from them in exchange for new clothes there was much more but i'm just uh, picking up a few things that struck me nancy started off talking about an interesting image of ambedkar ambedkar playing the violin and brought in the point about how people who engage with social change and who work against injustice also have their cultural concerns and a leader like ambedkar found solace inspiration and who knows what else in his study of the violin again what do you choose as uh, your means of the cultural uh, relaxation it's your own choice she talked also about online education that we are condemned to she talked about joblessness i think this theme was mentioned by others as well and how women are going to be affected how the poor are going to be affected after this pandemic is over again emphasizing the importance of culture of cultural engagement with the reality that we are faced with sudharak olwe talked about the position of dalits in society how they are engaged in occupations which are considered to be polluting and which are in fact occupations which involve danger to to life unpleasant conditions of work which are not dealt with because the dalits are considered to be uh, the lowest of the low uh, and the cultural expressions of dalits any kind of expression of joy any kind of celebration is often met with violence um whereas his images the images that he showed us showed that it's dealing with death dirt the detritus of society with the disease that we are faced with and also he showed the kind of living conditions that make the demand for social distancing quite absurd on the other hand the term social distancing itself has echoes of the kind of ways in which the dalits and the lower the, the, the castes which are excluded uh you know so 
social distancing as exclusion ultimately talks about uh, how dalits are excluded both from public resources in this pandemic when we need public resources so much and how they are also excluded from policy the poor the dalits you know who are carrying the burden of our society are somehow invisible to the policy makers we next had nancy reading out navjot's presentation uh, where she again underlined some points it is difficult to do justice to this because uh, as nancy herself said uh, navjot herself was not presenting it but she again talked about the callousness of the government she talked about how uh, the the lockdown that we are living through for the last so many months was started with only 4 hours notice which left so many absolutely perplexed as to what they were going to do next and what the future held um she also talked about uh, you know the ecology uh, the, the the question of how you must have this disturbed life on this planet and in fact we should be partners with other life forms you must are working under the logic of capitalism we have global warming climate change and somehow we are not able to cope with all this in the end she also talked about television which is the way in which most of us are able to get information about what is going on in the world and how these media are so biased in presenting the reality of the world to us barring a few channels which pro- provide a critical view but she ends up by saying that artists can move freely in the world of the imagination and all of us can because all of us in a sense are artists and perhaps in this situation you know when we are uh, brought down to having a webinar instead of a seminar where we can actually meet uh, where only virtual communication is possible we can still live in the world of imagination and build a world which will be a better world once this pandemic is over or once we have learned to live with it or once uh, we have worked out uh, some solutions finally kumar shahani's presentation uh i think he very poetically touched on many of the things which earlier speakers did um you know talking about the moon literally being sold off as property voiding it of poetry i'm just picking up a few words uh, from his text he talks about virtual communication as a very poor substitute for real interaction between human beings and also what it does to the lives of other creatures you know the the electronic signals denying the house sparrow the right to live um and uh, how we are somehow now uh, alienated from the wind and the rain we are bewildered by our complicity with the system the exchange of breath was the basis of all performance but the virtual world needs no breath then he warned us about the possibility you know when we are so busy communicating with each other in the virtual world the corporates are imposing a surveillance on us which is 24/7 and making us also into voyeurs of our own desire but then finally he talks about the effort of artists to and and the constant rebellion against all this to free melody from incantation and he says play on play on and i think that is the message that we can start uh, you know into the future with i now invite people to ask questions those who have been participating in this webinar if they'd like to uh, ask questions 
specifically of any of the presenters or even just to voice their thoughts i want to ask uh, uh, about, when this question is thrown open to all the panelists i mean uh, as artists and as victims of covid culture i mean a covid uh, crisis what what can be done to help the artists or what should be the demands from the art world uh, towards the government or generally what could be the demand for example are there art foundations who help out artists during the period of crisis that is one second there are so many of these workers who work in the uh, film industry or uh, tv programs and things like that spot boys and so various other services they are all now without jobs you know and um, is there any particular kind of a demands formulated for them or anything something has anyone heard or in, even about the uh, the fine art people you know the artists they don't have now it's because, i mean those who are dependent literally on uh, commercial sale of their uh, art products you know what is the situation they are facing it's not only about the big museum sites you know i'm talking about the regular uh, art people who even uh, sit on the footpath for the point that i would like to again emphasize is uh, the question of language the linguistic divide and that is something that you know existed before the pandemic and continues to exist during the pandemic but actually has been intensified during this time and as i was saying there is always this divide between the anglophone and the bhasha speakers and um, whenever i have curated retrospectives at the ngma bombay for instance because that's a public institution i always encounter people from all walks of life which is something that i don't encounter when i'm in a private gallery and uh, one of the things that i often do is to improv to give impromptu walk throughs to people in languages that you know i mean i can possibly articulate my concepts in it could be hindi gujarati marathi i can understand but i may not necessarily be able to communicate in so uh, i think that uh, what we really need to institute a pandemic or no pandemic is um, perhaps um, a certain kind of you know an inclusive artistic pedagogy uh, which is uh, based on multilingualism and i strongly believe in this because um, i remember before uh, the melli gobai retrospective which i co-curated with ranjit hoskote uh, closed down due to the pandemic um, i met uh, two students from the marathwada university and i had a very interesting conversation with them now this is the kind of conversation that i could not have had perhaps in the in this webinar space because um, those students may not have necessarily even uh, you know uh, they, they may not even have plugged into this uh, into this webinar because often you know although we uh, the galleries will always talk about having a net presence uh, because of the linguistic divide because of uh, you know i mean people who are deprived of social or cultural capital often uh, you know the algor uh, the algorithms work in such a way that you will never meet um, you know a diverse uh, people so i think that uh, what we really need to do is to uh, to to have communication at, at at both levels online and offline i don't think that we should fetishize the digital space you know because there has been this whole valorization of the digital space during the pandemic and of course i do believe that for example google arts and culture even before the pandemic has started you know taking these 3 360 degree views of um, artworks and galleries so that even people who cannot access a particular gallery or museum or a biennial can have access to that art but i think that again it's it's all about which language in which language are these images annotated who has access to uh, this these particular pedagogical um, you know projects so i think these these questions remain relevant um and and i and i, and I would always like to emphasize uh, you know i mean the, the question of this linguistic divide uh, and also of this deprivation which is based on social and cultural capital because i think that uh, you know our art world is this very small uh you know incestuous little art world which is quite elitist and um we, we can't talk about an inclusive pedagogy unless we are able to to bring in different constitu constituencies um thank you nancy i'd like to respond actually to uh, one question which has come uh, 
on the chat uh, where somebody talks about the impact on journalists, uh, especially journalists in the print media. A lot of them have been uh, thrown out of their jobs. A lot of newspapers have been downsizing. And we see a phenomenon where even earlier, even before the pandemic, a lot of people were, uh, instead of reading newspapers, were accessing news on their phones and uh, on their computers. And I think in Europe, I have seen that uh, people don't take newspapers anymore. Whereas reading the newspaper uh, was also a kind of uh, occasion for social interaction. I know that in villages, there would be little tea shops where uh, newspapers would be made available for people who did not even uh, were not even able to buy them and where people would come read the newspaper and chat that's a, one of the other things that we are kind of leaving behind maybe and the pandemic is only accelerating uh, these changes because as I made the point during my presentation that uh, uh, the, the the first thing that will go overboard is girls' education, and girls' education yeah. has always been a vexed issue. So I think that you know, whenever there there is an economic crisis, it's often the women in the family who get affected, um, you know, uh, immediately by these circumstances, and it's it's something that we need to take into consideration. Yes. Major concern: What's going to happen? Education has never been properly universalized in this country. It's something we've failed to do and I have no doubt that the caste system is partly responsible for this because we are, you know, uh, even though we have had policies for making elementary education universal right from the 1950s, we have never been able to, to uh, actually achieve this. We have never devoted uh, sufficient resources to this. And I have seen so many people just saying that the poor don't want to learn in spite of the, the great desire for uh, schooling, which uh, is actually there. And we have just not addressed it. And now, if we are, try if we are saying that online education is a substitute uh, for uh, teacher-pupil interaction, then uh, things are going to become much worse. Uh, if I may add, I also meant it in the context of livelihoods with so many migrant labor returning home. And I mean, now all the more depending on agriculture again, I think it's going to mean a loss for women in terms of livelihoods as well. So it's got a lot of gendered context, I mean, both the gender, uh, the migrant labor returning home and now seeking employment in agriculture in Manrega, depending so much on that. So I think it's got... Uh, even under the lockdown, domestic violence incidents has increased. Exactly. So, in fact, coming in all contexts here. Yes. See, I'm, I'm a journalist myself, hmm. and um, and um, as an artist also, and I know many friends, and you know, so there's had been any intervention for artists, you know, except few galleries like you did, but rest of the country, like you know, some uh, more did auctions um, for, um, you know, online auctions and, you know, they're, they're doing very regularly. But there's one whole section of uh, people which are like not part of a galleries or, uh, you know, they're small uh, artists and there's nothing, uh, you know, because they could not ask anything to government because uh, everybody was constantly on migrants and it was difficult to kind of open a mouth and ask, give us a rationale. So, because you know the little hierarchy as an artist, uh, so there are many artists who couldn't ask anything. And then you know I've got many messages for the monthly for ration from Maharashtra, and um, um, so it's very difficult situation. As this, you know, like we tried to write a letter to CM, but then you know we couldn't write it because on what ground we should ask them? You know, key, you know what is the ground? And uh, we couldn't write that later because we were discussing with the artist. Uh, so we kind of try to come together and there's no special kind of collective who could come together and take up take up uh, uh, questions or ask someone to help so that was happening and with the journalist i think because of this specially um, uh, uh, 
uh, from the from, uh, as the the revenue has fallen down from the newspapers so they already started asking people to leave with one month notice two months notice and and you know very senior writer with young writers photographers have been asked to leave immediately you know uh, uh, without even the the uh, the, uh, the 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 page makers or sub editors have been asked to leave the job immediately as they could the whole newspaper owners could afford them to sustain for two three months for sure but you know they don't want that loss to be at their end so so they don't want any loss so they immediately are sacking the people um, and uh, yeah so those two things which i just wanted to share that there's no collective as an artist or for journalist uh, because you know how to ask uh, for a help and that was the dilemma that was happening with the artist and journalist who are like you know not part of a, a elite class of art uh, or 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 a gallery artist as such yeah you are absolutely right sudarak because uh, there would be a certain percentage of artists who uh, are uh, you know who are with who are helped by the galleries yeah. or who have uh, regular shows with them but there are large numbers of people or artists who are outside of the purview of the gallery system and of course that's again yet another exclusion that we need to address but i i i found it very interesting when you were asking that as artists you know i mean uh, when when you're looking at the situation when there are all these uh, thousands of uh, migrant workers uh, you know who who are uh, who have actually uh, you know been been who have who have been facing this terrifying situation yeah. at present uh, how, how can an artist ask for ration right or food ration or for uh, or or ask to secure his her or his livelihood but i think that one of the things that you could actually ask on the basis of is your cultural right and that is what i was talking about in my presentation you know which i mean because of course all of us in general speak about political or economic rights but i think what i was trying to emphasize is that you know uh, political rights go hand in hand with cultural rights and we should not see cultural rights as something which is an add on or as something that is you know that 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 is inferior to the question of political rights True. and i and i think if if we if we change our way of looking at this question at this problem then perhaps uh, you know we'll be we able to demand it the government yeah, address so. this issue differently yeah but you know this so many things are happening on internet you know suddenly this 70% of people are saying that art doesn't make sense in pandemic you know um, so, so i that don't was, agree with that 20% people were saying that art will not make any sense in pandemic and uh, there's so much conversation happening like how to get uh, that small help from so uh, and we couldn't kind of come together and help each other in that sense uh, you're saying it's culturally right but you know this this whole country has divided so much that you know um, in in the in the and it segregated so badly in a comparable 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 wise in a such a way that the help will definitely not come you know to to those artists which are segregated from the main um, elite class of artist yes but can uh, i say something i think yes, uh, yeah i think there is a uh, there is a difference being made between the art and the artists because if if it is the pandemic is affecting the artists it has to affect the art so we cannot say that uh, and that if it is affecting the art obviously uh, you will find uh, reflections of uh, that pandemic situation in the art so i think that uh, i don't know how these things uh, can be separated between the artist and the art so i think that is a very important second thing is in terms of the uh, about this uh, cultural rights i think the main rights that we have to ask is about the access to the cultural capital you know in the sense that uh, uh, access to uh, uh, i mean get more art literacy and all those things are also important when we come to cultural rights because many people uh, i mean most people they are not culturally uh, i mean uh, artistically uh, sensitive because they don't understand the code which is there to appreciate the good work of art you know those those artistic codes cultural codes in that artwork have to be understood to appreciate that and without that people who roam the 
uh, Jahangir Art Gallery, uh, they are not able to go further than what gods they see there or uh, what other visuals that they see in their daily lives. They can only make a connection to that. But to go beyond that, you know, they need more education on that uh, this thing, on that topic, and that cultural right they don't have. So I think it's a very good point you suggested that it is access to the cultural capital which is deprived from the so-called non-cultured people, the ordinary people who actually produce culture in different ways. You know, in many ways they produce uh, culture by participating in uh, uh, so many of these productions in different ways, like I said, spot boys or whatever you know, as uh, cooks or whatever it is. You know? So I think that. Uh, what point you raise is very right. Actually, we have to think about cultural rights. And I wanted something to come out of it as a cultural right from this discussion. But uh, I refrain from this uh, in our scope because then we could be just expanding our scope too much. Praveen, thank you. Maybe thank Ranjita you. can also come in on this. Yeah, yeah. We haven't heard from her. I think uh, what we are uh, thinking and doing like uh, art is belongs to a very elite the contemporary art what we are um, and uh, um, the people who belongs to margin like we are talking about some um, common people mujhe lagta hai ki ye bahut hi disintegrated hai alag alag hai Jin laborers, workers ki hum baat kar rahe hai, because I feel like I'm in the middle of uh, both the things. Like I also go to the gallery and uh, and talking to you and um, sitting with some elites also uh, discussing these things. But uh, other side, dusri taraf hum dekhte hain ki jin logo ki hum baat kar rahe hai, wo to isme bilkul bhi kahin se koi unka matlab unko kuch pata hi nahi hai ki aisa kuch hamare bare mein ya matlab baat cheet ho rahi hai ya koi connection nahi mujhe dikhta hai aisa kya ye possible hai ya fir kitna zaruri hai aur isko kya hum matlab i mean i feel there is a difference of class and bahut hi fark hai jisko shayad hum mila nahi pate hain Ranjita, the question you are raising is very important and very important. I want to ask you a question related to this. Before you studied at the Patna College, how did you look at art? Was it a more holistic understanding of art? Or did you go to art galleries and therefore were initiated into an understanding of metropolitan, academic oriented art? I want to understand how you saw the practice of art. As, as something that was collective, gender inflected. Mm -hmm. See, uh, first I have seen art at my home. Ji. And it was really influencing me from a childhood. But that time I did not realize that I will go further with this. Uh, like oh. I saw my mother, she makes um sujini art at home it's uh, old clothes old clothes mm -hmm. and uh, cane weavers a lot of cane weavers have seen we, we and that is a um, profession of our um, belongs to community mm -hmm. so this all things are very inspiring for me i really liked mm -hmm. and from there i started to uske upar mera matlab dhyan gaya मुझे वो बहुत खास लगा और अच्छा लगा तो and from there here there is arts college and museums have been going तो वहाँ पे भी बहुत कुछ देखने को मिला तो वहाँ से फिर थोड़ा आप आगे बढ़ते हैं कि इससे आगे ऐसा कुछ चीज भी होता है जो museums में हम देखते हैं college में लोग पढ़ाई करके artist बनते हैं ये चीज जानने को मिला तो फिर वहाँ से आगे फिर दिल्ली और मुंबई 
और लंदन भी गई एक बार मैं तो वो चीजें इस तरह से ग्रो अप हुई लेकिन हर किसी को शायद इस तरह से नहीं होता है या आई डोंट नो हम जो एक्सेस के बारे में बात कर रहे थे कल्चरल कैपिटल हाँ पर यहाँ पे मैं ये कहना चाहूंगी यहाँ पे लाइक uh, like, ये मेरा अपना ऑब्जर्वेशन था hmm. और मुझे लगा कि मुझे uh, इस फील्ड में जाना चाहिए hmm. और सपोर्ट uh, भी मिला बहुत लोगों का hmm. इसलिए uh, लेकिन uh, बहुत लोगों को ये सपोर्ट भी नहीं मिल पाता है शायद hmm. Hmm. और वो चाह के भी नहीं कर पाते हैं तो so, uh, जैसे हम हिस्ट्री भी पढ़ते हैं जब मतलब hmm. पुरानी बातें जब देखते हैं जैसे मैंने अपने फादर से जो कुछ भी सुना hmm. कि सोशली क्या डिफरेंसेस था और hmm. उसके क्या प्रॉब्लम्स थे hmm. तो वहां जब हम देखते हैं और आज भी जब मैं uh, अपने कुछ फैमिली और रिलेटिव्स को देखती हूँ पर्टिकुलरली hmm. तो उनका लाइफ मुझे वही लगता है hmm. कि वो अभी भी शायद उसी जगह पे है जहाँ हमें इतिहास पहले से बता रहा है तो एक इंडिविजुअल एजेंसी जो होती है वो हम हम अपने अपने लिए हम उसको हम, हम उसको क्लेम कर सकते हैं और यू आर एन एग्जांपल ऑफ समबडी हुज एक्सरसाइज नॉट ओनली योर कल्चरल राइट बट आल्सो योर कल्चरल चॉइसेस मेड चॉइसेस एंड यू यू लिव दैट जर्नी एंड यू अकम्पलिश समथिंग ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ दैट for me that itself is uh, you know is 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 something that uh, we should celebrate and <laughs> perhaps uh, while celebrating that also reach out to those who have not been able to uh, make those choices because of various uh, you know circumstances which don't allow them to do so what's happened is that uh, you know cultural products have become commodities in uh, in in capitalism that's what what happens and there is there are so many sources of art uh in our village life in our society what we call folk art or you know the, the, the what meda has mentioned in her question the, the various forms of art which because the the artists themselves are finding it so difficult to survive their art also uh will not survive whereas pre capitalist societies were perhaps a little kinder uh, to these artists uh, and uh, in the pandemic we have seen uh people of this kind being thrown out uh you know without any resources whatsoever yeah again uh, the so called folk artists or tribal artists i mean they are again uh, you know at the receiving end of our uh, uh, gallery system uh they they are not they are not part of the art economy uh, and and when they are part of it uh, again you know uh, they are discriminated against often cheated so uh, again these are questions that we've been mulling about and talking about for many years uh, i i have been raising these questions from the time when i was in my early 20s and uh, i always believe that uh, these questions will not go away unless uh, we are able to dismantle uh, you know the very social and economic fabric of our society because uh, you know a, a folk artist or a so called tribal artist will not get her or his due uh, unless uh, you know we, we operate in a more equitable society so uh, you know if you if you live in an unequal society where there are huge political and economic asymmetries then that will also affect uh you know the transactions uh, that uh, that that involve uh, folk and tribal artists one more question about the relationship between the high art and folk art somebody else says uh, yeah. i just saw it on the screen please uh, oh another question coming yeah that is also linked uh, hi vandana uh. so uh, one ketanath uh, avati has asked about the link between the high art and the folk artist uh, as well as the artisans so that i would like to say something about this uh, no earlier you know like uh, see uh, it is so um uh, when i travel around the country i've been i've been documenting the lives of tamasha dancers for many years and um, you know somehow i reach some uh, houses of folk artist artist it's um 
you know it's difficult to even asset a water uh, you know or a job or an education so so there's a too much of a struggle to con- kind of continue that art and that practice is so difficult in this time of so much everything is so commodity uh, so it's very difficult to kind of unless and until there is a patronage um, the, or or a support uh, which which is not there uh, so we have to really think uh, uh, kind of you know uh, in a different way to see that this art lives or this this artist lives with their work right if the struggle for survival itself is not being addressed uh, yeah, then uh, we cannot ex- expect this kind of art to survive yeah. i think even if this webinar has raised some of these questions that i don't think we'll be able to go very far in in in, in answering them but uh, i think these are very relevant questions for the the situation we find ourselves in today There is somebody who has raised this question, Kedarnath Avati. Well, you see, one of the things I feel when we are talking, I mean, of course, all these things are so important when we are talking of the world of art, the relationship to people, the folk art, the high art, and so on, and the divides, the cultural divides, which uh, uh, Nancy also talked, the linguistic divides. but i think when we are now talking about this the this present crisis one of the things which i'm sure all of you have underlined it in some way or the other which is that the divides have become even greater the polarization is even greater than it was even i would say before the pandemic so uh to be able to then for those of us who are interested in a democratic society more equal society the questions we have to be raising would also have to look at the totality of this crisis there's a question from ojas uh he's talking about how certain kinds of art is no longer recognized as art he takes the example of artisans in local architecture and the, the trend of pakka housing has ruined the art of the local artisans contributing to the character uh, uh, of of a building and uh, you know these are also concerns that we need to address art exists in so many uh, locations really and art potentially exists in so many more and we are Losing a lot of that. Yeah, maybe we should wind up now. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this. Praveen, George. George uh, wants to give a word of thanks, and yes, he wants yeah. to do okay. something. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Vandana, uh, Nancy, uh, Vasudev Raman, Ranjita, Sudarat ji, and also uh, Navjot who could not uh, log in because of uh, some technical difficulties she faced at her end. and also all the participants who have uh, joined and made this uh, webinar a great success uh, and we hope uh, this was a wonderful experience for everyone and let's meet often and take this experience forward uh, in a better way thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.